Hey all, in this AP Computer Science A video, we're going to cover Unit 8 Two-Dimensional Arrays. If you don't like the pace of the video, adjust the playback speed in YouTube. Check the timestamps to jump to specific topics, and check the video description for other resources. In this lesson, we'll learn about 2D arrays in Java. Let's start by declaring a variable A. Notice two sets of square brackets after the data type which indicate A will point at a 2D array of int. Next, let's initialize the variable with a new array object. The two numbers tell Java the dimensions of the array. Being an array of int, the elements will default to zero. Here's the visualization we typically use for tracing. The first number indicates the array will have three rows, while the second number indicates it will have four columns. This visualization is very useful for tracing, but it isn't the most accurate representation of the data structure. Let's take a look at alternative visualizations that'll help us better understand how Java stores a 2D array in memory. The first number, in this case three, creates a one-dimensional array of size three. The second number, in this case four, creates a one-dimensional array of size four inside each of the indexes of the first array. A two-dimensional array can be described as an array of arrays. If we wanted, we could carry this process deeper and create three, four, or five-dimensional arrays. Now let's look at another way to create a two-dimensional array. Here, we hard-code specific values into the array. Again, let's look at an alternative visualization. The outer one-dimensional array contains two objects for its two indexes. Each of these objects is a one-dimensional array of size three. Since we primarily use the first visualization, I prefer to code each of the inner arrays on its own line. It's easy to look at the code and see the top line corresponding to row zero and the next line corresponding to row one. Now that we've created a couple of two-dimensional arrays, let's access them. This line of code will print out the contents of the B array at row zero, column one, and output the int four. This line of code will assign the value nine to the A array at row one, column two. This code will print the evaluation of the Boolean expression. Array A at row two, column zero is zero. Array B at row one, column one is four. The expression zero is less than four evaluates to true. In this Java tutorial, we're going to learn how to traverse a two-dimensional array. We declare a two-dimensional array of type int. The name of the variable is ARR, and we've hard-coded the values. Now let's look at some code for traversing the array. The outer for loop traverses each of the rows in the 2D array, and the inner for loop traverses each column in a given row. In Java, 2D arrays are row major. The first number specifies the row, and the second number specifies the column. Now we'll trace the code. We set r to zero. We'll continue the outer loop as long as r is less than arr.length. When we take the length of a 2D array, we are counting the number of elements in the outer array. Using the traditional visualization, we are counting the number of rows. For our current array, we can think of this expression as r is less than two. r is zero, so this evaluates to true. Now we set c to zero. We check if c is less than arr index r dot length. Let's talk about what this means. arr points to the outer 1D array like it did two lines up. ARR index R means we are pointing at the element at index R. In this case, R is zero, so we are pointing at an inner array at index zero of the outer array. We take the length of the inner array, which is three. If we want to use the traditional visualization, we could say we are taking the length of row zero of the 2D array. For our current array, we can think of this expression as C is less than three. C is zero, so it evaluates to true. We output ARR, row zero, column zero, which contains two. Increment C to one. C is less than three, so we continue. We output ARR, row zero, column one, which contains three. Increment C to two. C is less than three, so we continue. We output ARR, row zero, column two, which contains one. Increment C to three. C is not less than three, so we terminate the inner loop. We output a new line, increment r to 1, r is less than 2, so we continue, set c to 0. Now that r is 1, we are checking the length of row 1. c is less than 3, so we continue. We output arr row 1 column 0, which contains 8, increment c to 1, c is less than 3, so we continue. We output arr row 0 column 1, which contains 5. 
increment C to two, C is less than three, so we continue. We output ARR row one column two, which contains six, increment C to three. C is not less than three, so we terminate the inner loop. We output a new line, increment R to two. R is not less than two, so we terminate the outer loop, and the program finishes. When using for loops, we also have the option to modify the values in the loop. This modification causes the code to double the value of each element in the array. We can also modify the increment. In this case, R advances by two instead of one. Now let's look at another array. We'll traverse this array using for each loops. For each loops are easier to write, but they must traverse every element in an array. Also, while you can modify the values in the temporary variable, doing so won't change the values in the array. Looking at the outer loop, we see the name of the array following a colon. This lets Java know which array to traverse. Before the colon, we see a temporary variable named row. This variable must be able to hold the elements contained in the outer array. The elements in the outer array are 1D arrays of int, so we declared row as an array of int. For the inner loop, we are traversing each of the inner 1D arrays of int. Our temp variable is an int, so it can hold the int values. Let's trace the code. First, we create the row variable and have it point at the element in index 0. Currently, row is pointing at the 1D array at index 0. We could also say that row is pointing at row 0 in the 2D array. In the inner loop, we create an int variable value and initialize it with a copy of the element at index 0 in row 0. We output value, which is 4. For our second time through the inner loop, value is set to a copy of the element at index 1 in row 0. We output value, which is 2. We've traversed the entirety of row 0, so we terminate the inner loop. We output a new line. Next, the row variable changes to point at the 1D array at index 1. We could also say that row is pointing at row 1 in the 2D array. In the inner loop, we create an int variable value and initialize it with a copy of the element at index 0 in row 1. We output value, which is 6. For the second time through the inner loop, value is set to a copy of the element at index 1 in row 1. We output value, which is 3. We've traversed the entirety of row 1, so we terminate the inner loop. We output a new line. We've traversed all the rows in the array, so we terminate the outer loop and the program ends. Nevada Smith and the Temple of Arrays. For this AP Computer Science A style FRQ, I recommend you do the problem using the linked PDF. To jump ahead to the answers, check the timestamps. Archaeologist Nevada Smith is on an adventure in a mysterious temple. He is in a room with a floor that changes symbols on its tiles every minute. The floor is represented by a 2D array of strings, each representing a symbol on the tile. For the floor to be safe to cross, the following conditions must be met. 1. There must be at least one straight line of tiles from the left side of the floor to the right side, where all the tiles in the line have the same symbol. 2. The floor must not contain either X or Y, which are danger symbols. 3. Not all symbols on the floor can be the same. Here, the sample floor is encoded as a 2D array of string. Here is the Temple of Arrays class with the three method bodies you will be writing. Part A. Write the line of identical method. This method takes an array of string objects as a parameter representing a row of tiles on the floor. Each string in the array represents a symbol on a tile. The method returns true if all the symbols in the array are the same. Otherwise, it returns false. Pause here and complete the problem. Part B. Write the isFloorSafe method. This method takes a 2D array of string objects, floor, where each string represents a symbol on a floor tile. The method returns true if the floor is safe based on the conditions below. Otherwise, it returns false. Pause here and complete the problem. Part C. Write the can cross floor method. 
This method takes a 2D array of string objects, floor, representing the temple's floor, where each string represents a symbol on a tile. The method returns true if there is a safe path across the floor that meets both of the following conditions. One, at least one row will return true when passed to the line of identical method. Two, the floor must be safe according to the is floor safe method. Complete the can cross floor method below, which should utilize the line of identical and is floor safe methods you implemented in part A and B. Pause here and complete the problem. Part A solution, line of identical. This for loop traverses the entire array of string. It compares each value in each index to the contents of index zero. Since we are comparing strings, we use the equals method. We are actually looking for an index that is not equal to index zero, but because there is no not equals method in the string class, we use the equals method and then reverse the value with the not symbol. As soon as we find a string that is different from index zero, we immediately return false. If we make it through the entire for loop without finding a string that doesn't match index zero, we return true because we've proved that the strings in the array are all identical. Part B solution, is floor safe? We start by storing the first value in the first row of the 2D array in the first symbol variable. Next, we set all symbols same to true because we will assume all the symbols are the same until we find evidence to the contrary. The outer for loop pulls each 1D array out of the 2D array. The inner for loop pulls out each individual symbol from a 1D array. We check if the symbol is either X or Y. If it is, the floor is unsafe, so we can immediately return false. Next, we check if the current symbol is not equal to the first symbol. If we find even one symbol that is not the same as the first, we've proven that all symbols are not the same. We can't immediately return true because even though we've proven that all the symbols aren't the same, we can't be sure that there isn't a danger symbol later on in the array. After we've traveled the entire 2D array, we will return true as long as all symbols the same is false. Part C solution can cross floor. First, we call the isFloorSafe method and pass it the pointer to a 2D array in the floor variable. If the method returns false, we know the floor is unsafe and we can immediately return false. If the method returns true, we can continue on and check if there's a path of identical symbols that Nevada Smith can use to cross the bridge. We know a 2D array is actually a 1D array with each compartment containing another 1D array. This for loop traverses the outer 1D array. Each time we go through the for loop, we pull out one of the inner 1D arrays and pass it to line of identical. If the method returns true, we have found a path and can immediately return true. If we finish the for loop and never found a row of identical symbols, then there is not a safe path and we return false. You've reached the end, and if you have a test coming up, good luck. Tell me in the comments, was the pace of this video too fast, too slow, or about right? Check out the other resources in the video description and on the channel, and I'll see you soon.